Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that looks quite comfortable. Do you think I should get... Am I too low? Yeah. No, you're right. Yeah. It was quite interesting when you had your legs folded <laughs> on the couch, like... <laughs> this is pretty much it, like this, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that looks quite comfortable. So, do you think I need to make it, like, more... more lighting? Oh yeah, definitely. It's way too dim. Max it out. We're wearing white. <laughs> Might as well be as bright as you can go. It's true. Yeah. It'll on. make for the most resolved image. Oh yeah, go all the way. <laughs> all the way. All the way. Wait. Ah, there we go. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> okay. Okay, good. So, um, I'm just thinking, can I do... I just took it out of the shot, but I can move it as well. Hmm. It's kind of like having... Having... Uh, it feels a bit like being in a straight jacket or... Maybe having been brought under control. Oh yeah, you're talking about that plastic. Yeah, right here. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if this could come off, it would probably be better, right? Yeah, that doesn't work. Plastic on the other side as well. Yeah, that's the detail, but... I've got to attach this. It's almost too ridiculous. Oh, that's very weird. I just somehow. Yeah, my walls are a little bit on the delicate side. Yeah. Don't worry about it because I have the material. That's my finger that apparently. Oh, did you hurt yourself? Yeah, as long as I don't put blood on the couch, I think it's okay. Shit. Did my wall scratch you? Yeah. The wall. He scabbed me. I got scabbed it. That's pretty classic. Okay. So, um, do do you want to unzip or do you want me to zip it up? Oh, what the? Oh, this? Yeah. Sure. And I suppose this. I mean, this one here is. It's quite snug. Um. Ah, fuck. Okay, so how do you reckon? Do you reckon I should? What's that? I have this. The last time I used this, it didn't work, so I need to confirm that it's actually working. I think you have to push record twice. Oh really? On the camera? No. Zoom thing. Oh yeah. Definitely do that before. Right, sit up a little bit. I don't know how comfortable this is. Mm. Well, it's not uncomfortable. It's not as bad as being waterboarded. Mm. But it's somewhere on the spectrum. Okay. Mm. Luckily, that's hair from the back of my head. <laughs> I have enough of that. Okay. So, the question is, do I... Do we sit in conversation? Do I put on a costume also? I'm not sure. You're, you can direct and decide what makes sense for you. Yeah. I could go either way. Fuck, I don't know. 
<laughs> I'm just concentrating on concentrating. Okay, so I feel like I'm kind of in the void. It's kind of fun. Where am I? Hello. Help me. Yeah, maybe. Or better yet, don't help. Maybe it's a bit wrong if I don't wear a costume. Oh, yeah, if you're just sitting there doing an interview, that's funny too. <laughs> Small? My suit is quite small. This is quite funny because I can't see a thing, so it's just I just have to take <laughs> your word for it. <laughs> I like it. I'm finding it incredibly difficult to zip it up. Oh yeah, you want me to try? It's okay. I've almost. I mean, I have to feel my way to try. Is it the is it the head part? Or it's the back part. Right? <laughs> Where are you? Okay, don't move. Don't move. I'm gonna get the keys. Um, okay, I'm going to come through. Wait a second. Oh, fuck, did I move the screen? Hang on. Um, okay. It's, it just needs to be, like, right. looped in. Oh, yeah, it, this, is it, this is it right here. Okay. But wait, it's the zipper is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This yeah. has got to actually be put in the thing. Okay, hang on. That's the problem. It's totally funny, I've never actually done zippers up the line, but... Yeah. It's just quite hard to do it from the back. Yeah, 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 behind you. Wait, this one is not quite in the bottom. Okay, I see what's going on. Hang on. Oh, no wonder it's so hard. This one is getting kind of caught on the leather. Wait, I got it. I just got to get it past this bit of leather where it's catching there. Yeah, it wasn't quite going to the base. Wait, it's still not quite going to the base. No, now it's at the base. Okay, and then get that in there. And there we go. Okay. Wait. Okay. It's not very easy to break. Well, I don't want to get your hair. I'm going to get some of them, I'm sure. There, That's okay. Does this go in or out? In. Oh boy, okay, in. Okay. Well, that ought to do it, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Woof! I fuck it pretty hot. It's not that bad, it's kind of nice. It's sort of... Sort of like being in a sauna. Yeah, in a way, in a manner of speaking. I might have my nose. That's tricky when you got itch on your nose in one of these. I've written down some. Let's see if I can see what I wrote down earlier. I can't hear what you're saying. Are you serious? No, no, I can kind of hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Okay, so. Uh, oh fuck, what are I going to say? <laughs> I love the idea of an interviewer who can't see the words they wrote on the page anymore. It's quite wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so... One question that I was wondering about was in relation to costume. In relation to costume, yes. Yeah. I've noticed that in a lot of your works, you um, often go into a situation in one costume, and then you have some kind of transformative situation where you 
somehow reveal another costume. Yet there's also other performance works that you've done where you enter a situation in a specific costume and you don't change into another costume. Do you think there's any difference between the kind of transformative costumes where you somehow infiltrate through, I guess if you like, camouflage or a simulation? Is there any difference between that or showing up in costume? Um, yeah, I mean, when you transform into another, into another costume, it can be used a couple of different ways, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we've done it before to, to reveal who we really were underneath, <laughs> you know, or you might do it to, um, amplify a kind of message that you're delivering so if you're um you know I, I guess the most obvious one is when we're acting as Dow Chemical um and wore this golden phallus suit underneath a breakaway business suit it was it was revealing what was underneath to illustrate what these guys in business suits really were all about which was basically using a giant golden phallus to uh, control workers in the third world. But, you know, we've done a bunch of other costumes too, like when we were, we were impersonating the Bush campaign in 2004, and we had a costume, we had mascot costumes, like Smokey the Log was one of our costumes, it was like a replacement for Smokey the Bear, mm. and you know, it was just an absurd, ridiculous costume, and you know, the, there was not really a transformation there. And I guess that's, the transformation is fun just because it's such a part of, of so many stories. You know, it's, it's something that captivates people. It, it captivates our imagination. You know, all kinds of stories like the, the you know, the, are, are about somebody undergoing a change, seeing the light, you know. Uh, being born again, being, um, uh, seeing the world differently because of some event that happens to them. And I guess that's, that, that kind of change is part of the sort of, it's, it's a drama that you can tell very simply by changing costumes. Yeah. So do you think there's something about the fact that you look, like the situation that you enter, do you think there's something important about that? When you say, for instance, if you go to a conference and you show up in a business suit and you're pretty much anonymous like everybody else, but you're anonymous within a specific way, is that somehow important also? Yeah, I mean... Like, how do you think that changes your audience? Well, I mean, costumes can be used to infiltrate, right? It can be a way to blend in, because obviously everybody's wearing a costume. If, if you're wearing clothes, you're wearing a costume. And actually in our culture, if you're not wearing clothes, then you're definitely wearing a costume as well. <laughs> um, then you're dressed as a nudist or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's all about identifying who's in and who's out. You know, and if you want to be in, you dress like everybody else, so you try to blend in, and you and in the world of business, that's easy. It's all about dark suits and uh, and and neckties and button-down shirts. So, but I don't. I forgot the question. I, I can't remember. It's basically about the if you like the function of this sort of blending into the situation, if there's something for you that happens when you begin from being like everybody else, in that whatever situation it is that you choose to take on, or if you somehow enter a situation looking different. I mean, it's like, how, I'm kind of curious about how the the, the way that the other people that are in that situation, the way that they perceive you 
and how they take the transform transformation, how they accept that or react to it differently depending on whether you show up and shock people initially or if you somehow create a language where you can visibly and behaviourally somehow be similar to what the rest of them are like. I guess that's what I'm saying. If, because you've done a lot of these kinds of interventions, I'm curious to know if there's any difference that you perceive in the way that people behave towards your work. Hmm. Things that we should seize about the way people behave? Yeah. Um, well... I think there is something to the interesting about how obviously certain kinds of costumes garner respect in certain circles in our culture. So if you go to a business meeting and you're wearing a you know dark suit and a red tie or something, then then you're you, you get the green light to people's respect. And so, you know, if you add that to being some, introduced as somebody very important, suddenly you are super important. It doesn't really matter who you are. It's just that that, that becomes the assumption. And then everyone behaves differently around people who are super important. You know, they, they act serious about their jobs or they try to go out of their way to help that important person. So, you know, I... Overall, it does have an effect, uh, and, it, and, it, and it does come down to a few basic things, like, yeah, what are you wearing? And it, those things aren't important in the long run, but they're important for the initial impression. And in the world of business, where, you know, people are just trying to trade business cards and stay in touch and, you know, grow their Rolodex, that's all that really matters. Do you think there's a um, form of emancipation that takes place when you use that situation to reveal what it really is, visually? Like with the golden phallus that you mentioned earlier. Okay, sorry, could you repeat? I kind of started losing it. it. <laughs> emancipation? The patient? Eman <laughs> oh, emancipation. <laughs> I thought you were saying the patient, you meant the patient, <laughs> and I was really confused, but, uh, okay, so emancipation, definitely, definitely, what about that, and it would be really nice if somebody could come along and finally release us from these weird extra skins that we've been entrapped in, but what, what was the rest of the question about emancipation, because I just made it up. <laughs> it was also about... In one of those situations where you go into a professional situation and you infiltrate it by looking similar to the people that are also in that situation and gaining some kind of respect and power. Uh -huh. And then do you think there's some kind of emancipatory transformation? Do you think when you transform into these other kinds of situations visually through like for instance the golden phallus do you feel that there's something emancipatory about being able to do that oh yeah it's definitely pretty fun to and freeing to be able to um to take on other roles and you know i think that costumes obviously can play a role. A costume like this doesn't feel particularly emancipatory, but that's because it's so restrictive. <laughs> I mean, I can't see anything. My face is really hot. I mean, it's freeing in a certain way because I, I can't see anything, and so that makes me act and think differently. But, you know... I don't know if I'm answering the question. Yeah. Try again. Um, I'm finding it very unemancipatory, actually. But you're right. On one level, this costume... Oh, unemancipatory to wear the costume? Uh, well, no. I think it is 
For me, I think it's different. It has a certain emancipating capacity because it takes me beyond my normal situation, my normal visibility. It puts you into a realm where the visuality of the way that you look somehow is transformed in a particularly, I guess, contrived way. So then it somehow allows you to go beyond the situation. Well, for me anyway, I can I can see the, but on a physical, I can see the emancipatory capacity of it, but yeah. on a physical comfort level. I'm it's pretty thinking, rough, huh? I'm just thinking about when I can take my mask off and breathe. Yeah, it's, the, these suits are not, um, you know, they're not for the meek. They're definitely something that you might have to train to wear for an <laughs> extended period of time. And they definitely, I mean, I could see that on some psychological level, somebody who was into the idea of isolation might like to have this because it does result in some amount of sensory deprivation, but maybe not enough. Yeah. You know, because it's, it's not silent. It's not, it's more like, um, of frustration, it becomes a frustration because you still hear things. You still, you still see things. Just you don't see it. Actually, see anything. You can open your eyes and see the inside of the suit a little bit. <laughs> a little light coming through here and there. But yeah, it's a different thing than feeling like you are. I think that emancipatory. Mm. Sometimes it's just a feeling of like relief, like ah, I finally got that mask off. And sometimes it's this feeling of being enabled or being free or being able to, you know, to do more or do things differently. And definitely with this one, I'm, 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 I'm interested in the former. I want to, I want to get to the point where I feel like I can take the mask off. Yeah. Why do you wear a mask like this? Why? Mm. Um... I guess it's so that you can become part of your environment, you can somehow become part of the couch or something, I don't know. But mm -hmm. it's also where you can um, constrict your own experience and your own visual. I guess, yeah, the things that you're talking about can also be the reasons why it's interesting to wear it. Because it transforms the way that you deal with the situation. Because normally if you think about it, an interview situation tends to be quite comfortable. And everything's centred around uh, making sure, like if you're on TV or something, that you get your makeup done right and that you're comfortable and that you're not too constricted in your clothing. So it sort of takes those norms and tries to turn them around and see if anything else comes out of it. Mm -hmm. um, as to whether it does I don't know because I can't breathe very well. But one thing I was going to say also is that it brings me back to a question I was thinking about in relation to costume. Uh, costume in theatre is perceived, people talk about, they talk about theatre and they talk about costume, right? Then they often talk about costume in everyday life or different forms of costume and how we costume situations. Um, but then there's also outfit. Do you think there's any particular difference between outfit and costume? Hmm. Well, an outfit seems to suggest something that you could... Um, wear to any event an outfit any you know semi-formal or when I say semi-formal I mean it could it could be even not it's like when you go out you wear an outfit when you go trick-or-treating you wear a costume when you go making mischief you wear a costume when you go surprising people you wear a costume when you go to shock the shit out of someone you wear a costume when you go and you get up in the morning and go to school or work, you put on an outfit 
or just some clothes. It's different. The costume is more. Mm. So do you think that outfit, like when it comes to performance art, for instance, do you think that outfit is utilized more than costume? Mm. Yeah. Do you think performance artists are consciously thinking of their outfits? When they're intentionally trying not to wear a costume, for example, they're putting something on and performing. What do you think it is that that, that is enabling? Are you still breathing? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, I almost I think I, I lost myself in here. I am still breathing, but I forgot to actually talk or listen. Did you ask ask a question? Because I kind of got lost in here. Yeah. You know, my biggest problem is that my fear is all over my face. Your what is all over your face? My hair. Oh, your hair, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what do you do about that? It's constricting me. Well, I'm trying to stick my hands through my mouth. Yeah, maybe you could use your tongue to move it over. <laughs> <laughs> like, what else do you use? You can't, like, put your fingers in there, right? I'm trying, but it's not working. I'm just going to have to accept it. Yeah, you're just going to have to accept your fate. And your yeah. fate involves having uh hair in your face it's that's the kind of the way like my throat feels really tight like this feels tight in my throat yeah. it feels a bit wrong it feels hot but i just have i've learned to accept it and i feel like i could probably live this way yeah and actually for me it started to become much more comfortable if you just realize like you see if you just accept it wow I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I mean, much more comfortable, I don't know. I'm, I'm feeling like it's, like, uh, like it's just as uncomfortable, but I'm going through different phases where, where I feel like I either need to or don't need to ever emerge. Yeah. Oh, this is nice. I'm trying a different position. Do you think the, the physical or the visual effect of this is greater? What do you think the social effect of this? The, I mean, what, what do you think it is that this is actually affecting mostly? Um, oh, I think it's very hard to actually maintain a kind of communication it's sort of it, it, it's almost like it's it, i find that I've, i'm kind of receding inside myself that i i it's sort of um like i can't see you all i can do is hear you and i can imagine like i kind of would like to look at you but at the same time I, it kind of doesn't matter because you know that you look like uh somebody in a white suit it's not like a unique, it's sort of, there's something very odd about it, yes. <laughs> Do you think it's neutralizing? Yeah. Whew. It feels quite conformist from here. But <laughs> yeah, it, it feels that way to me too, conformist. Yeah. See the way I conformed? That was that was even conformist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, suddenly I'm getting a little bit tighter fit around the neck. Do you need me to take your mask off? No, I can do it myself, I think. You sure? Well, I can try. Okay. Is it time? You can take your mask off. We can ask a couple of questions. I can still sit here for a little couple of minutes longer. Um. The question, well, that's a lot of hair in there. All right. The question. Oh, God. 
Wow, that is hilarious. <laughs> You've got that recorder. I had no idea. The question I was going to ask you is, I mean, because you didn't really answer the question about outfit and performance art. Oh, was there a question about that? I don't remember. Okay, t I'll answer that. What did, What was it? It was to do with, um, wait, do you think there's a... I mean, it's interesting, because, like, do you think that costume would be considered to be an art, like, visual art, or do you think it's somehow something else? And outfit, do you think outfit is, like, um... Do you think that that is something that performance artists have more than oh. the people that make costume? Do you think that it's something that distinguishes the art form of appearing in a certain configuration visually, like putting your body into something? Mm. Do you think the outfit distinguishes that from the idea of costume, which is feels like it's been sort of, costume feels like it's been quite defined, but maybe it hasn't, I don't know. Well, costume feels kind of transformative, whereas outfit feels like a, like an expression or an augmentation of, an extension of, of who you might already be. So, in costume, I think it can be taken pretty broadly, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's it's not precisely a veil, although in this case, I think maybe it is. <laughs> it's um, but it's a transformation. Yeah. And and then is that performance art, or not? Well, is it art? Is it performance? What? Yeah. <laughs> yes. The answer is yes. Would there be any other? Um, oh, I feel like I feel naked with my, my mask on. You know, my mask is off now, and it makes me feel kind of wrong talking to you with with your mask on. Is there something wrong with that? Yeah. What do you think it is? Well, it feels like there is a unequal balance of. It's, it's, uh, now I feel like I'm clearly, like, more in control because I can see, and you still can't see me. Yeah. And you're constrained, and I'm less constrained, although I'm still wearing the whole suit, so I'm, I'm a little less constrained. But, you know, whether or not it's costume, I feel like it is a kind of, it is something where... Where people would either like um, pay money for this, or governments would pay money to have you put people in this for a while. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I answered your last question, though. I'm not sure. Do you know? It's it's quite interesting because the restriction that I feel inside my mask, it. Quite, it's not very enabling in terms of the thought process. It's very hard to actually think whilst inside this. Yeah, I, I buy that for a dollar. <laughs> I think it's super hard to think inside that. I agree. I mean, I said some things, but I don't remember thinking at all. I was talking inside there, but I, there was not conscious thought, I don't think, that went into the speech came out of my mouth. I think it was words. Yeah, it's like the, for me anyway, it feels like the outfit or the costume is constricting my brain processes. Well, wow, that's um, pretty heavy. Um, <laughs> I think, I think I could, um, if your brain processes get too restricted, maybe you should tap out, you know? Okay. Like, like, um, you can just, you know, knock twice or something to escape, and then we'll implement the escape, uh, sequence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
So, okay, I'll try and think of something concrete. Like your, the costumes that you've worked with in the use scene, in your interventions, which ones do you think kind of stand out to you as the most interesting? And which ones have had the greatest effect? Oh, which, and why? which interventions or which costumes? Costumes. And actually, before you answer that question, can you answer this question, which is, when you make an intention, does the costume come first, or the idea come, and then the costume come later? Do you ever work from costume, or do you work more from ideas and then create costumes to suit your narrative? Well, some, we, do, we do both. We work both ways. Sometimes you have the perfect costume, to use in, in, in an event, we ended up with these um, these camouflage, hairy camouflage suits called ghillie suits mm -hmm. that turned out to look a lot like mops. So we use those for cleaning up a series of banks, you know, like metaphorical big mops. Being dressed as a mop is pretty funny. You can go crawl around the floor of the bank. That's a case of like finding the activity for the costume, whereas finding the costume for the activity is something that we do, you know, like earlier I mentioned the thing where we impersonated um, Dow Chemical on the BBC. And for that, all you need is a, is a business suit and a necktie and a fake ID. Yeah. And in a way, those are the most legitimizing of costumes. So, you know, we're obviously not going to be dressing up as, as police officers because uh, you can fool people that way. But maybe the next thing away from police officers, like um, prison guard, war guards, I don't know. There's got to be something else we could dress up as that would work, serve the same purpose. Yeah, so those legitimizing costumes, they have a very different function to the ones where, say, like you mentioned with the mock costumes. Right? Do, you, do you find that people react to them quite differently? Do they? Do you think it's to do with whether or not the audience is conscious of the costume? Hmm? Did you just finish your se uh, question? I mean, I just did. Oh God, I couldn't figure out what you said. I, I heard it and I didn't understand that it was the end of a question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Those, the costumes, do you think the legitimizing costumes have a greater function than the other ones? Um, I think that legitimizing costumes are a, way, are a way to get a foot in the door and they're a way to reveal something. They're a way to reflect people around you, to reflect culture around you. But then if you want to jump into the world of parody, that's when you pull out the other costumes. And sometimes it's not just that you want to make fun of something or to create a parody. Sometimes you just want to pull a reaction out of people because they might not react unless there's something outrageous to look at. And so, you know, a costume like this, worn the right way in the right place, would probably get some interesting reactions to people, from people, I'm sorry. And that, that could be a lot of fun. Yeah. See, I'm, I mean, these costumes weren't made specifically for this situation, but I'm quite interested in my research to figure out how the same costume performs differently in different situations, embodied by different people or taken and performed, like I say, performed differently. It, mm. It's, I think then it's sort of, it's hard to know if, the costume is something in itself, or if the costume becomes something, depending on how you inhabit it. And it could be the same for the outfit. Uh-huh. The, the answer is yes. Yeah, but I just, I mean, I think it's curious, like, there's examples of a few artists that have worked in situations, in their views, like legitimizing costumes, if you want to call it that, like you mm -hmm. mentioned. And they have never referred to them as costumes. But mm -hmm. then they're never talked about as artworks either. 
that Libra talked about is being part of the work. But at the same time, they just kind of mentioned and such and such did this and she was wearing that outfit or mm -hmm. the outfit was blah blah and that mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. Whereas I'm wondering if there's something in the outfit that performs a certain function which is also key to the artistic work. Even if the costume, even if the outfit is a legitimizing outfit, that can mean something beyond, I mean, being just something that we put on. I mean, is there anything that we just put on? How conscious the artists of that, do you think? Can you hear me? Have you stopped hearing me? Are you still breathing? Ah. Are you okay? Did I just go silent and pass out or something? They gave me a fright because I thought that you weren't wearing your mask. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just, I just went into the zone. I kind of like forgot that I was wearing the suit at all. In fact, I forgot I was even here. I just was sort of gone. Yeah, because I, I was trying to ask you a question. I yeah, think. what was the question you were asking? Like, I, I oh, completely fuck. lost track of it. You know, I've completely lost track of a lot of my questions. I think it's to do with my outfit. It could be that, that it's hard to concentrate on questions when you're wearing one of these. Yeah, so then I wonder what kind of information comes out. Yeah, obviously it might be hard to sell that they have utility. I mean, if you're going to bring these things to market as like intelligence enhancing seats, this test might prove that kind of to be a bit of a problem. But I don't know. I'm just saying. But it's interesting because if you think about language, how you formulate it through having a clear thought process, if you're wearing something like these costumes, it's, it's impossible to do that. It's impossible to formulate things clearly from inside this because you can't structure your thoughts, right? Right. But what was I talking about? Costume? Not being able to structure thought. <laughs> <laughs> I could barely put it together though. I could barely put together a sentence to make meaning of it. Do you know, and... It was like words were beginning to hover one by one. Yeah, yeah, do you know, the, the, it was kind of like a form, it, to me, I mean, I don't know, because I, this is the first time I've worn this suit for any lengthy period of time. It, it felt like torture. Yeah, I think so. It felt like, you know, a few of your extremities were kind of s sort of stifled. Mm-hmm. Almost like, um, yeah, I think that actually it could be described as an isolation suit.
I feel like I've, I've receded into a cocoon. Mm. I, I, I just... They're actually quite comfortable like this. Mm -hmm. They're quite relaxing. Because it's quite good because you don't have to... It's like your, your body is somehow protected. Yeah, that's true. It's armor. <laughs> Medieval. Real. <laughs> do you think um, outfits got anything to do with the institution? Uh, my, no. Do you think uh, the objects that you make in your interventions that you use, like for instance, Gilda and things like that, do you think that they could be considered costume? Sorry. Oh, you're bored you to sleep. Oh, God. You asked me another question? Mm. I was asking you about oh, Gilda. Shit. Gilda and some of the objects oh, that you've used. Oh, my God. I've just, like, I've lost my mind. <laughs> this is insane. Okay, this is just a really awesome interview. Okay. All right. <laughs> I want to be interviewing a passed out person. This <laughs> is hilarious. <laughs> I was thinking, um, things like Gilda and, you know, the candles that you made from, were they, were they from dead people? Uh, Vivolium, yeah, it was the candles made from the human victims of climate change. Yeah. Do you consider those things to be part of your costume? Hmm. Yeah, in a way, um, something like a Vivolium candle is a prop, right? It's, or it's an object. But it's kind of as an extension of the masquerade, of the costume, of the, mm. you know, and if you, any objects, if you have enough of them, they can lend you legitimacy as a speaker, if you're handing out special gifts or something. Even if it's, even if it's $5,000. Yeah. So do you think that they could be somehow considered costume if they do, like you just pointed out, make you somehow more legitimate? They give you a certain space. Mm-hmm. And they reinforce that, that you're trying to kind of, that space that you're trying to inhabit somehow. But do you think, um, do you think those, those, those things would be different if they were on a stage as opposed to in a social situation? <laughs> yes, oh sorry. Did I fall asleep again? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to say where we were. We're in, um... Oh my gosh, we're somewhere? Yeah, we're in Stockholm. Oh my gosh, here we are in Stockholm, everybody. Hi. <laughs> this is Mike My Bonanno. name's Mike Bonanno. I'm with the, uh, man. Um, I'm... dressed up in this very functional and comfortable costume. Oof. If it is, in fact, a costume. If it's not... It's an, an outfit. outfit. <laughs> is it an outfit? <laughs> No, you're supposed to be answering the questions. Wow, this stuff really blends in with the couch well. I like yeah, that. I know. That's why I thought it worked quite well. It's a good choice. Yeah. Nobody could see us except for our heads and hands. Yeah, yeah. If we just get rid of those, we'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <laughs> that's true. Okay, so what, what the hell was that? Okay, do you think that these costumes or outfits would be different if they were in a... Um, on a stage. Yeah, on a stage. Well, it depends on what the stage is. If if they're in the theater, then they then they they become a bit more dead in the theater because then they're then the costumes become about dressing somebody up. Mm. They don't become about transformation of experience, or they don't become about as they're not anymore as full of potential for things like symbolic uh, communication because they were understood then within the frame of the theater mm. and a costume like this if you wear it on stage it's still part of a, a everybody can say oh it's part of a show but if you wear it somewhere else it defies people's um, expectations and then it puts them in the driver's seat to try to figure out 
what they are and usually people do f figure out what they are they they'll figure out their own reasons i mean they may not line up they probably won't line up with everybody else's but they'll think they have it mm. so there's a certain amount of mystery or unknown quantity within this kind of uh, garment if it goes out into a unexpected social situation yes yeah so I had another question that I just thought of. Um, what was that? Um, yeah, so like if you imagine you're in a situation, in a regular kind of social situation, in, in public and you're wearing this kind of costume, how do you think this is distinguished from fancy dress? Just walking down the street in fancy dress. Um, well, fancy dress, to me, says, it only says that you're dressed up. Because I don't speak English very well. Because I, I don't really know what fancy dress is. <laughs> That's the problem. I'm too American to understand that. <laughs> okay. okay. What I mean is like if some dude goes to a sh shop and he buys a Superman costume yes. and he walks down the street. Yes. How is that different to somebody integrating a superman costume into something more than going from your house to a party mm. well it seems like the different ingredient is probably like thought and and and, and kind of trying to understand an appropriate context like if they have a reason for being superman on the way to the street then it makes sense mm. You know, I'm not sure what the reason would be, but part of it is that a costume remains a costume only, excuse me, well, I think a costume remains a costume if it's not reaching for the, like a little bit beyond the unexpected. I think the super, it's the Superman thing that's throwing me for a loop. Mm. Because Superman is something that people already understand. Yeah, okay, so if someone, say for instance, if we take these costumes and you wear those in the street, in, on the way to a party, how does how is that different? Like, what's the difference between walking down the street just regularly like this, mm -hmm. or consciously deciding, okay, that costume is going to function in that way. I'm going to test it out to see what kind of response comes with that. Mm. Because if you wear it from your house to a party, the chances are you get, might get one of two people thinking that you're doing some kind of strange performance. Yeah. But then, if you're doing some kind of strange performance, you might get one or two people thinking that you're just dressing up for a party. Yes. <laughs> and so, how, is the, how are those things different? Mm. Well, I mean... <laughs> uh, I think that it's that that it's it's about whether or not you're actually challenging the the viewer to step outside of their frame because there's a way there is a way in which we all try to normalize or naturalize meaning naturalize our surroundings naturalize our sensory input so we want it to seem normal we we'll want to make it normal we make it normal through narrative usually you come up with a story you come up with a reason you come up with a context and something like a superman suit is really easy 
something like these costumes is already a bit harder. Um, and then in a way, it's like how much I think whoever's putting the costume on, then it then it becomes interesting to see what the interplay is, the communication between those viewers. Like, how much do you want to lead them to some kind of conclusion? You know, like if we wore these suits at a toxic waste site, it'd be pretty obvious to most people that we were there doing toxic waste cleanup, even though even though we would be doing nothing of the sort, because these have nothing to do with toxic, but they're, 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 like, they're like more like some weird like Tweedledee and Tweedledum <laughs> suits. But, the, but that would be a suitable narrative for most people. And so in a way, coming up with something that's a little outside of that, I mean, when we use kind of weird off-the-shelf costumes, I don't know, I think about Super Barrio or something is like a good example. There's a superhero, but he was a superhero that nobody knew. And he was a superhero, I mean, when he first emerged, he wasn't, super, he wasn't a guy in a Superman suit helping people. He was in his own custom-made Super Barrio suit. And then he defied expectations by being chubby. You know, it's like a chubby superhero. <laughs> like, what? What is that? You know? Um, and it was incredibly functional in terms of communicating something, you know, in terms of grabbing attention and you know, demanding attention. Mm. And then, in, in, in the case of Super Mario, really leveraging it and being able to speak through the uh, medium of the media, you know? Get the message out. Amplify it. Mm. So... I guess there's a lot of these real-life superhero people. I like guess Super, Super Barry, when was he around? He, well, he's still around, apparently, but he started out in, uh, I think, 1988, uh, the Mexican, the earthquake in Mexico City. That's when he first came on the scene. Mm. There was a flash of light, and... He emerged. <laughs> a little chubby superhero. Chubby yeah. superhero ready to fight for the rights of the disenfranchised people of the neighborhoods of Mexico City that were neglected by the government in the cleanup efforts or the, you know, the repair, or the disaster relief efforts. And then he went on to continue challenging politicians to wrestling matches all over Mexico and mm. Tijuana. San Diego border region. And since then, yeah, he's kind of, he became a folk hero in Mexico. Super Barrio. He but wasn't he, he wasn't dressed in like a sort of wrestling outfit. Wrestling outfit, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's dressed as a wrestler. As a now I'm getting, What's that? Now I'm getting some kind of visual imagery. Yeah. Yeah. Some sort of reference to that. Cape, little cape. Red and blue and yellow outfit, mm. chubby mask, full mask. I guess I was thinking about that because of being inside the full mask. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so Super Barrio. So do you do you know what's happened to Super Barrio? Is he just is he still operating? I think way? he is, yeah. I think he's still around. Super Barrio Gomez. <laughs> yep, he's still around. He's he's worth a look up. You can look him up. Yeah, I think I he's think he's been I identified see. as you know, and, and he has a he does have a name that's sometimes associated with him, a human name. People do communicate with him. Mm. He occasionally shows up at art events. Yeah, I think I know who you're talking about now. But it's, but I guess, um, yeah, so that's a really good example because that is actually someone who's taking the kind of costume that you would imagine would be a dress up, but he's using that dress up somehow to put across another message beyond the dress up itself. So it's, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that it's kind of pointing to the fact that it's the interface between the dress up and the social situation as well as what you're pointing out which is the narrative like how you construct that in advance 
Yeah, sometimes it's it's just you just grab attention and then you grandstand once you have the attention. Like those guys in the UK who are um, lobbying for the father's rights and they're dressing mm -hmm. superheroes and climb up the facades of buildings and just occupy them and drop banners and stuff and they did it just to get enough attention and then they would say the thing in the media like you know mm. and do you think that those particular things are perceived as artworks or do you think they're perceived as something else uh, i think those are perceived as political theater mm. and not as artwork so the super barrio just he ends up being more in the realm of as much in the realm of performance art mm. as political theater but what do you think it is about Super Barrio that puts him in performance art? Um, I would say that it's the level of poetics that he employs, you know? It's like the, mm. it's the way that, it's, it's the, it's the character that he, that, how he inhabits that character. And the fact that the character is completely, there's something completely, um, Uh, complete. There's something complete about the character and the performance, and he never breaks character. It's not like these dudes who just dress up in a costume, and then they say, you know, they say that this I'm doing this because I need to get attention because I don't have access to my kids. Mm. Right? It's, it's a very different kind of thing. They're breaking character. They're they're saying, you know, hey, hey look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. But it's, it's not that much different than jumping up and down and screaming and waving your hands. No, it's um, just some kind of visual indicator to get that initial attention. Yeah. I mean, Super Barrio is the invention of, of a character. I mean, Super Barrio is his own person, you know, with his own mythology. Mm. And, his own, and so it, there's, there's something about the completeness of it mm. that I find very different. And let's say just dressing up as a Captain America and going and doing something. Yeah. So you think that if somebody co-opted Super Barrio's costume, that they would somehow perform that character differently? Oh, yeah. And I think that's happened, actually. I think that Super Barrio has been more than one person. Mm. And but it's obvious. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, the thing is that nobody is... I think anybody in the costume can be Super Barrio because that's sort of the message of Super Barrio. Mm. Or anybody can be, we all can be Super Barrio, but still nobody can be Super Barrio because you have to have just the right amount of fat. <laughs> you have to be chubby enough. Yeah, so it's... And then that way you have enough weight to be able to like body slam a cruel mayor or... A so it's not really any longer about the costume in that instance. Well, it's about, I mean, the costume has enabled something to take place, but the, the real kind of material quality is not necessarily in the costume, but it's in the interrelation between the costume and the person wearing it in a situation. I think it's just different for different situations. I don't think that we can... No, there's no general kind of thing, right? I don't think we can narrowly define a set of rules for no, this. No, no. Yeah. I think this, is, this is where I'm trying to... I mean, I'm having trouble in my own research because... Well, I think, that, I think that you could develop a taxonomy for it and develop different kinds of costumes and how they're de and deployed in different ways. Mm. And then Super Barring would be the, I think, the archetype, like one type of way of deploying a costume. Mm. And then I think that there's other costumes that would work in other ways, you know. Um, so yeah, that's I think I think that you have to start looking at it as categories of of action or purpose or um, or co communication, like categories of communication, like ways that costumes can function mm -hmm. in some kind of communicative matrix. And I say mm. matrix because I'm thinking, well, you know, sometimes you can use a costume just like this, but, you know, so we can have a chat. <laughs> um, yeah. But other times you could use it where you're just expecting to, you know, have the costume serve as a backdrop to some other kind of spectacle. Mm. 
Yeah, but I guess it's also like, um, I, I, it's difficult because with my research and stuff, I'm trying to unpick these things about costume and, you know, part of it is to construct a theory of costume. And it's actually very difficult because, in a way, I feel like as soon as I start to pin down these things or categorise them, I feel like the costume somehow loses its interesting qualities. And maybe there's something appealing for me personally about costume because it's not so defined. Maybe because it's not so much in academic discourse. Well, maybe the thing that defines a costume is that there is a there's a human inside, a person inside a costume. You or, or is a costume also going a dog or a cat or Mm. Any kind of entity could have a costume. Yeah, that's true. <clears throat> but I mean, I was thinking of maybe, like in some ways, a costume seems like a funhouse mirror. It's like another person, but transformed into something else. Mm. And in that way, it fits in with all of these in archetypal kind of mythological ideas of the you know the trickster of the shape changer of the it's like the original creation stories the original stories of almost every indigenous culture um, that involve this kind of transformation and mirroring right it's a process of changing shapes Changing into something else, and then surprising or confronting mm. others, either individuals or groups, with this, either with the transformation or with the new identity, mm. and, and that, and, and there's something that's revealing about that, or poetic about that, or so I don't know. It's like transformation, revealing. Uh, so I mean, it's. I think it's like, um, it's not like it's one thing. If it's many things, that's where it becomes interesting and that's where it starts to actually really perform, right? And then it performs differently for different people. In certain situations, it's not going to be the case that the same set of conditions are projected out from a particular garment to everybody because you have different points of reference obviously. Yeah, and then also like one is a costume a, a costume and one is a a uniform, a uniform, you know, one is a costume a uniform, vice versa. Like if I put on a cop suit right now and walked around mm. town. Is it a costume or a uniform? What is it? Yeah. Or is it an outfit? If I'm if I am a policeman and I put on the police suit, then am I just a policeman? Or am I wearing a policeman's outfit? Or I'm in costume. I mean, if I'm not, I guess I'm in costume, right? Mm. But then mm. at the same time, what it, what distinguishes you from being in costume and apart from knowing... I mean, externally, it's no different, right? Maybe. I mean, yeah, to the viewer, it's just another policeman. Then, then the performance that isn't for them, maybe. Mm. And, you know... <laughs> If you're performing and you're wearing a policeman's suit and you're not a policeman and you're wandering around, I guess you're performing for yourself, right? It's like nobody's going to notice or care that another policeman. I'm not saying suggesting we should do that. I was just trying to come up with a, I mean, whatever. You could be a train driver. You could be a person who repairs highways. So then it becomes... All these people wear uniforms. Hmm. And it's more about institution, right? Right. And, but, you know, the business suit, another uniform. A little more widely worn. Hmm. So because these things are so embedded into... I mean, it's interesting because, yeah, people don't always talk about the fact that they're embedded, embedded into institutional thought or behaviour or learned behaviour or acceptances. I mean, it's, I think... When it comes to, um, I mean, 
it's actually quite important that you, as a human in the world, actually hold on to an element of doubt when you approach those kinds of formal structures, right? Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's useful to do that. But, but uh, yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is... Um, I usually start my conversation with police by asking, Hey, where'd you get the costume? <laughs> and what kind of responses do you get? Oh, no, I don't actually do that. I've never asked like, a <laughs> cop that question. <laughs> I'm sure you, the responses wouldn't be very pleasant. Although, but <laughs> they, may, they may just say, ha ha, funny, kid. <laughs> something. But what if you catch the one person who's actually just wearing it and isn't police? <laughs> make them shit their pants. <laughs> oh. oh, fuck. I, I'm sorry, but I'm just trying to work out how the hell to make my research into something because I, I think it's... I think costume is interesting in the fact that it's not totally decided upon. It's not like a formula necessarily. There's, like you said, there's aspects that can be formulaic and there's things that can be kind of taken and changed and used in a very direct kind of specific way. But it's not like it's not like theory of composition, right? Mm. What do you think it could be? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, probably not. It's probably a little bit complicated to uh, make it fit any one model. <laughs> Do you think we should forget it? Yeah, I think that for now we should hang up the throw in the towel. Yeah. I'm feeling like I'm I mean, feeling... I fall asleep a few times in the costume. I feel like I should fall asleep one more time without the costume. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think you're kind of right. And I have to say that my... Um, uh -huh. My level of conversation is not really going anywhere. Well, I kept falling asleep, so I don't know what the conversation was. Can you get mine? Yeah. I think also... Um, no, I've been up since three as well, and I think I got like I think I got to sleep at about one or one thirty or two. So you yeah, I hate when that happens. Okay, so I think I should just not even speak. It says goodbye, see you. I think it's probably the best thing it can say at the moment. Oh yeah. Tight on the lower side here. This was my light reading that I tried to take one earlier. Oh my god. Gosh, one reader, huh? <laughs> what did you read it? I don't know it? what to say about that. <laughs> I really don't know what to say. You don't think there's any future there for me and the Goffman reader? Oh, I, I think the Goffman reader is probably exactly what you need to read, but. <laughs> it's it's kind of in some ways it's a little bit hard to find the motivation. Yeah, it looks like a challenge. Ugh. Oh shit! So, uh oh, I moved the camera. Should I turn it off? Yeah.